Hello. The topic of my talk, the title, is that augmented reality is here and it's ready to use. And I hope by the time we're done you agree, but I'm also hoping for a little bit more. Uh, I'll settle for it's not just about collecting monsters with your cell phone, and I'm really hoping that you'll see that augmented reality is more powerful than you probably imagine. And after the last couple days of talks about AI and, and robots, uh, I think I'll go out on a limb and say that augmented reality has the ability to save us from AI and robots. Now, augmented reality is, is, is around us in our phones, and, and we see it playing games, and, and what you probably don't know is that it's already here, and we're using it at work. Now, um, how can it defeat artificial intelligence? Um, AI seems really terrifying. Um, in fact, let me give you an example of how, just how scary it can be. Alexa, order me three pallets of diapers. Now, that might go over better at home. Um, but the, the thing about it is that we're on a first name basis with our artificial intelligence. It's, it's with us, it's around us. I make light of these things not to take them lightly, but to help us understand what we're actually facing. And why some of the people, some of the smartest people in our society have come to the conclusion um, that artificial intelligence and robotics could steal our jobs and kill us. And that's because of fear and uncertainty. And fear and uncertainty aren't new to technology. Fear. Uh, like when trains were becoming commonplace, uh, there was this idea, and people were very vocal about it, that if you rode a train, you would die. Our frail constitutions, not being familiar with a, a mode of conveyance faster than a horse, if we went over 30 miles an hour, we might die. And uncertainty, uh, like in the Victorian era, when futurists were asked to imagine what transportation would be like, in 50 years, and they imagined Victorian-era living rooms suspended from hot air balloons and crossing the ocean in a week. And in that 50 years, airplanes were, were invented. So fear and uncertainty often make us get it wrong. And why is it with AI and robots that we're always afraid <clears throat> of being replaced? Well, it may come back to the heart or to the beginning of AI. And this is John McCarthy, the man who coined the term AI. And in one school of thought, AI and, and technology could develop to a level where it would replace all the capabilities of humans. That's scary, replace humans. People were afraid. But there's another school of thought. Douglas Engelbart about the same time, came up with a different idea. The idea that intelligent technologies could enhance the capability of the human mind. They could help people to do more. Uh, Douglas Engelbart invented the mouse and, and, and many of the aspects of modern human computer interface, and he thought that the technology in the service of humans could help us to do more. That's exciting, that's an alternative. And and I think the first time that I heard that AI might kill us uh, was when an AI defeated a grandmaster at chess. Uh, I didn't think it was that big of a deal because uh, I'd lost to computers at chess for a long time. In fact, most of us have probably uh, or would lose to a computer at chess since computers started playing chess. And the reason that we were really afraid by it was actually that the technology was advancing in a way that we couldn't understand with our current frameworks. And in fact, um, when technology advances in a way that doesn't fit into our existing frameworks, that's actually what we call progress. And, and so I don't think that robots are going to try to, or AI is going to try to kill us, but what about trying to take our jobs? Factory workers have been told that they'll be made obsolete by robots. Um, researchers suggest that over 30% of jobs in the next 20 years will be replaced by bots of some kind. 
unfortunately, I think that part's true. Um, but what percentage of jobs from 100 years ago are still around today? That's part of progress. But those workers are going to get displaced. Those workers will need to learn new skills. They'll need to do new things to adapt. And how do we help them? How do we empower them? Um, it's probably not a surprise that the solution to me, or part of the solution, is actually augmented reality. And I've been working with augmented reality for about 10 years now. And what I've found is that AR isn't, isn't actually about technology. It's about putting ideas into the world around you. Um, the world that you live in, the world that you interact with people in. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the technological barriers, barriers that we talk about today um, aren't really what's important. This, this cube, I think, is, is a great example. Um, it's the idea of the cube represented in the world. As you move around in the world, it changes. It changes in, in, in concert with the world so that you see the idea there. But there's no technology involved. Um, and in fact, it's not what you see at all. Um, the idea of the cube was there. That is pure augmented reality. And I think one other really important aspect that you can think about AR, you have to compare it to uh, its, its cousin, VR. VR, which we all know a little bit better, is about immersing yourself in a world and a curated world. Um, and, and while you may not actually be tethered to a computer, um, in the idea of a visual computing paradigm, uh, VR very much is the desktop where you're in a confined and controlled environment specifically for the purposes of having that experience. And if you think about it in those terms, AR is transforming the world that you're in. You take it with you, you take it with you to help you know things when you need them. Um, and, and you can very much think of it as the mobile equivalent of, of visual computing. And, and that's helpful. Um, and, and I've personally seen it uh, able to transfer knowledge in a way that no technology before could because it's human-centric. Um, you could read a book about chemistry, or you could hold chemistry in your hand with augmented reality and, and really understand it better. And, and again, it's not just about playing games um, or, or, or using your cell phone. AR can help you see things you couldn't see before, and it's being put to work in, in, in places every day where those insights can empower people, can, can help them to, to see things and, and interact with ideas in completely new ways. Those, those things come together to make a bridge between the digital world and the physical world that didn't exist before. We, we get from the physical world and, and the ability to interact in our world an, an intuition, an ability to apply pattern matching so that we can learn faster and, and, and solve real problems. And, and with augmented reality, we can apply that, that capability to the digital information and, and solve those problems in the real world. We, we saw that augmented reality had such a good, had such a powerful ability to help us to learn, we, we developed this impossible device that was so complicated you, you couldn't use it. Every one of those switches and buttons actually changes what it does based upon the position of the others. And, and while it's predictable, and you can have a manual and look up and see what's next, it's, it's very difficult to do, but AR can collect, connect the dots for you and make it almost easy, simple to operate. We've even taken AR to some of the most extreme environments in the world, environments where it's life or death based upon situational awareness. And it's not about making things more lethal, it's actually about being able to control the application of lethal force, to be able to stop the firing when it's too loud and too noisy and too distracting for, for auditory commands over a radio. One of my favorite applications of technology empowering people is, is actually uh, what you saw with Richard Browning. He, he uses technology to make it so that he can fly without an aircraft. And you may have noticed the augmented reality helmet that he was wearing when he did it to help him understand uh, what, what the condition of his suit is. And there's one more application uh, of augmented reality that you might not be thinking about, but it'll be here before you know it. Over the next few years, you'll start to see augmented reality in your car. And, and it's been well studied for decades that head-up display uh, solves the problem of blind flight, the, the look-away problem that makes it dangerous when you're trying to make a decision and, and you've looked away and looked back on the road. 
But even more importantly, as cars begin to drive themselves, augmented reality will help you to build a relationship with the vehicle and understand what it sees and what it's thinking and what move it's gonna make next so that you're more comfortable and you can start to trust that autonomous vehicle that you're in. Now, this may sound like it's all theoretical, uh, but we put it to the test. And, and we've seen time and time again in studies, in our studies, independent studies, academic studies, that augmented reality can transfer knowledge in a way that technologies couldn't do before it. Um, in this one study, we used it in the assembly of a gas turbine power plant. And uh, typically, to do one activity, workers required <clears throat> eight hours of classroom time and over 450 minutes to complete the task. And with augmented reality, you could skip the classroom time and get right to work. And the average worker, in fact, all of the workers in the study, completed it in less than 50 minutes. 50 minutes. And it's, it's not just the time it takes. In another study of, of doing inspection on wind turbines, we actually were able to reduce the time, but also reduce the errors significantly. And this is about doing knowledge transfer to empower people to do more than they could. And, and before we go, I just wanted to tell one more story um, and, and get you thinking about what augmented reality can accomplish in the future. And for me, uh, it took a really personal journey to get there. And along the way, when I was working and started working in AR six years ago, my second son was born. Um, this is Valentine, he's, he's an amazing boy. He's curious, he's brilliant, he's caring. And one of the hardest moments for me was when he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and I felt helpless. And his mom and I were searching for treatment options. And we were fortunate enough to be connected to one of the best doctors at one of the best hospitals, the head of pediatric neurology. And it took us months to get the appointment and it lasted less than 15 minutes and we were told as CP goes, it's not bad. There's nothing you can do. And he'll never walk. One of the biggest regrets in my life is when I walked out of there and I almost accepted it. His mom and him showed me how wrong I was. We met Dr. Park at St. Louis Children's Hospital and he was doing a revolutionary procedure for children with CP. Valentine would have spinal surgery. They would cut open his spine and they would find the spastic nerves and they would cut them so that he could walk. And the procedure was a success. Valentine walks. That transformative procedure has been done for over a decade. The head of pediatric neurology at one of the best hospitals in the world didn't know about a transformative procedure in their specialty. And it wasn't their fault. They've dedicated their life to, to saving people, to improving lives. If they had known about it, they would, have, they would have told us, of course. The problem was that the knowledge wasn't being transferred. I know how helpless that made me feel. And I started to look and see what could augmented reality do in the area of medicine to help. And I, what I found was that surgery itself, a $2 trillion industry, is available to less than one third of the people on the planet. It means five billion people don't have access to basic surgery. If you're one of those people and you need your appendix removed, you die, you die. Now, experts, even the ones who think robots and AI are coming for our jobs, they seem to agree that surgery is so complex and so expensive that robotic surgeons will only be available for specific procedures and in some of the most expensive hospitals in the world. Could AR make the best doctor in the world better? I think yes. I think the data says yes, it does. It could. But we don't have to make that argument. We know that we can train new doctors. We know that we can teach new procedures to experienced doctors. And if we can get the information flowing in AR 
so that the training is happening, then we can make it available to general practitioners anywhere in the world, or even Good Samaritans when they need to be a surgeon, when they need it available. That augmenting of people could transform lives around the world, and I, I believe that augmented reality is the bridge between who we are and, and who we're capable of being. And I really believe that, that that ultimate version of you, that augmented you, will never be replaced by a robot or AI. Thank you. <laughs>